Welcome to the new video seminary. Here is Dr. Hoffman. Subscribe and give me likes. Let's start now. In previous lessons, we answered the question why do nations trade by describing the causes and effects of international trade and the functioning of a trading world economy. While this question is interesting in itself, its answer is even more interesting if it also helps answer the question what should the nation's trade policy be? For example, should uh, Canada use a tariff or import quota to protect its automobile industry against competition from Japan? Who will benefit and who will lose from an import quota? Will the benefits outweigh uh, the costs? This lesson examines the policies that governments adopt toward international trade, policies that involve a number of different actions. These actions include taxes on some international transactions, subsidies for other transactions, legal limits on the value or volume of particular imports, and many other measures. This lesson thus provides a framework for understanding the effects of the most important instruments of trade policy. After this lesson, you will be able to evaluate the costs and benefits of tariffs, their welfare effects and winners and losers of tariff policies. You will be able to discuss what export subsidies and agriculture subsidies are and explain how they affect trade in agriculture in the States and in the European Union. And last but not least, you will be able to recognize the effect of voluntary export restraints, VERs on both importing and exporting countries, and describe how the welfare effects of these VERs compare with tariff and quota policies. A tariff, the simplest of trade policies, is a tax levied when a good is imported. Specific tariffs are levied as a fixed charge for each unit of goods imported. Ad valorem tariffs are taxes that are levied as a fraction of the value of the important goods. For example, 25% US tariff on imported trucks. The specific tariff would be then $3 per barrel of oil, for example. In either case, the effect of the tariff is to raise the cost of shipping goods to a country. Tariffs are the oldest and the simplest form of trade policy and has traditionally been used as a source of government income. Until the introduction of the income tax, for instance, the US government raised most of its revenue from tariffs. Their true purpose, however, has usually been twofold, both to provide revenue and to protect particular domestic sectors. In the early 19th century, for example, the United Kingdom used tariffs, the famous corn laws, to protect its agriculture from import competition. Both Germany and the United States protected their new industrial sectors by imposing tariffs on imports of manufactured goods. The importance of tariffs has declined in modern times because modern governments usually prefer to protect domestic industries through a variety of non-tariff barriers such as import quotas, limitations on the quantity of imports, and export restraints, limitations on the quantity of exports usually imposed by the exporting country at the importing country's request. Nonetheless, an understanding of the effects of 
a tariff remains vital for understanding other trade policies. There are also other ways in which governments influence trade. Let's list some of them. Export credit subsidies. This is like an export subsidy except uh, that it takes the form of a subsidized loan to the buyer. The United States, like most other countries, has a government institution, the Export Import Bank, that is devoted to providing at least slightly subsidized loans to aid exports. Secondly, we can name national procurement. Purchases by the government or strongly regulated firms can be directed toward domestically produced goods even when these goods are more expensive than imports. The classic example is the European telecommunications industry. The nations of the European Union in principle have free trade with each other. The main purchases of telecommunications equipment, however, are phone companies and in Europe these companies have until recently all been government owned. These government owned telephone companies buy from domestic suppliers even when the suppliers charge higher prices than suppliers in other countries. The result is that there is very little trade in telecommunications equipment within Europe. And last but not least so-called red tape barriers. Sometimes the government wants to restrict imports without doing so formally. Fortunately or unfortunately, it is a way to twist normal health, safety and customs procedures in order to place substantial obstacles in the way of trade. The classic example is the French decree in 1982 that all Japanese video cassette recorders had to pass through the tiny customs house at Poitiers, effectively limiting the actual imports to a handful. To determine the word price and the quantity traded, the first point we define import demand curve. It's helpful and in the second export supply curve, which are derived from the underlying domestic supply and domestic cur and demand curves. A home import demand is the excess of what the home consumers demand over what a home producers supply. Foreign export supply in point two is the excess of what foreign producers supply over what foreign consumers demand. In the point three, there's next key term to explain effective rate of protection. To encourage domestic auto industry, the first country places a 25% tariff on imported orders. Allowing domestic assemblers to charge $10,000 instead of $8,000. In this case, it would be wrong to say that the assemblers receive only 25% protection. Before the tariff, domestic assembly would take place only if it could be done for $2,000, the difference between $8,000 price of a completed automobile and the $6,000 cost of parts, or less. Now it will take place even if it costs as much as $4,000, the difference between the $10,000 price and the cost of parts $6,000. That is, the 25% tariff rate provides assemblers with an effective rate of protection of 100%. The fourth key term, consumer surplus. It measures the amount a consumer gains from a purchase by computing difference between the price he actually pays and the price he would have been willing to pay. If, for example, a consumer would have been willing to pay $8 for a partial of wheat, but the price is only $3, the consumer surplus gained by the purchase is 
dollars. In number five, explaining efficiency loss, let's look at the picture on the right. There are two triangles whose area measures loss to the nation as a whole and a rectangle whose area measures an offset gain. A useful way to interpret these gains and losses is the following. The triangles represent the efficiency loss that arises because a tariff distorts incentives to consume and produce, while the rectangle represents the terms of trade gain. That's our point six key term that arise because a tariff lowers foreign export prices. The gain depends on the ability of the tariff imposing country to drive down foreign export prices. If the country can't affect port prices, countries small, for example, region E, which represents the terms of trade gain, disappears, and it is clear that the tariff reduces welfare. A tariff distorts the incentives of both producers and consumers by inducting them to act as if imports were more expensive than they actually are. The cost of an additional unit of consumption to the economy is the price of an additional unit of imports. Yet because the tariff raises the domestic price above the world price, consumers reduce their consumption to the point at which that marginal unit yields them welfare equal to the tariff inclusive domestic price. This means that the value of an additional unit of production to the economy is the price of the unit of imports it saves, yet domestic producers expand production to the point at which the marginal cost is equal to the tariff inclusive price. Thus, the economy produces at home additional units of the good that it could purchase more cheaply abroad. With this, we go to point seven. The net welfare effects of a tariff are summarized in this picture. The negative effects consist of the two triangles B and D. The first triangle is the production distortion loss, resulting from the fact that the tariff needs leads domestic producers to produce too much of his good. The second triangle, and this is our point eight, is the domestic consumption distortion loss, resulting from the fact that a tariff leads consumers to consume too little of the good. Against these losses must be set the terms of trade gain measured by the rectangle E which results from the decline in the foreign export price caused by a tariff. In the important case of a small country uh, that can't significantly affect foreign prices, this last effect drops out, thus the cost of a tariff unambiguously exceeds its benefits. In point 9, you should explain the key term quota rent. The difference between a quota and a tariff is that with a quota, the government receives no revenue. When a quota instead of a tariff is used to restrict imports, the sum of money that would have appeared with a tariff as government revenue is collected by whoever receives the import licenses, License holders are thus able to buy imports and resell them at a higher price in the domestic market. The profits received by the holders of import licenses are known as quota rents. In assessing the costs and benefits of an import quota, it is crucial to determine um, the who gets the rents. When the rights to sell in the domestic market are assigned to governments of exporting countries, as is often the case, the transfer of rents abroad makes the costs of a quota 
substantially higher than the equivalent tariff. And the last but not least, tenth key term, let's explain broker content requirement. It is a regulation that requires some specific fraction of a final good to be produced domestically. In some cases, this fraction is specified in physical units, like the US oil import quota in the 60s. In other cases, the requirement is stated in value terms by requiring that some minimum share of the price of a good represent domestic value added. Local content laws have been widely used by developing countries trying to shift their manufacturing base from assembly back into intermediate goods. In the United States, a local content bill for automobiles was proposed in 1982, but was never acted on. Firstly, in contrast to our earlier analysis, which stressed the general equilibrium interaction of markets for analysis of trade policy, it is usually sufficient to use a partial equilibrium approach. Secondly, a tariff drives a wedge between foreign and domestic prices, raising the domestic price but by less than the tariff rate. An important and relevant special case, however, is that of a small country that can have any substantial influence on foreign prices. In the small country case, a tariff is fully reflected in domestic prices. Thirdly, the costs and benefits of a tariff or other trade policy may be measured using the concepts of consumer surplus and producer surplus. Using these concepts, we can show that the domestic producers of a good gain because a tariff raises the price they receive. The domestic consumers lose for the same reason. There is also a gain in government revenue. Fourthly, if we add together the gains and losses from a tariff, we find that the net effect on the national welfare can be separated into two parts. On one hand, is an efficiency loss which results from the distortion in the incentives facing domestic producers and consumers. On the other hand, is a terms of trade gain, reflecting the tendency of a tariff to drive down foreign export prices. In the case of a small country that can't affect foreign prices, the second effect is zero, so that there is an unambiguous loss. And the last, but not least, point five, the analysis of a tariff can be readily adapted to analyze other trade policy measures such as export subsidies, import quotas and voluntary export restraints. An export subsidy causes efficiency losses similar to those of a tariff, but compounds these losses by causing a deterioration of the terms of trade. Import quotas and voluntary export restraints differ from tariffs in that the government gets no revenue. Instead, what would have been government revenue accrues as rents to the recipients of import licenses in the case of a quota and to foreigners in the case of a voluntary export restraints. At the end, there is just to say subscribe and give me likes. See you soon!